came back, started my, figured out I wanted to be a physician assistant, and uh, started my undergrad at Marion here in town, and figured out that biology was interesting, but if I could do a history degree, which was something I was very passionate about and still am, and still become a PA, that's what I was going to do. And being Marion, a great uh, campus and great advisors, they said, yeah, it's going to be a little tough, but you can pull that off. As part of the requirements to graduate with a history degree, you have to do a capstone project. And when I approached um, one of my faculty, I said, I've got this really interesting thing. I think you'll really like this idea. I wanted to study moonshining and bootlegging in the Holy Land. Uh, she gave me this look and said, you're crazy. <laughs> you're, no one's going to talk to you. You're not going to find anything in the newspapers. And um, good luck, but you need to think of a secondary topic. Um, so I kind of started uphill battle. And what the, the real, re the, the the start of all this was I worked in the butcher shop in Pipe. And as things happen in small towns, guys would gather at the end of the day, and as Phil and I would be cleaning up the shop, they'd be telling stories about back in the day, and the moonshiners and the bootleggers would come up every once in a while. And what I figured out was nobody had ever written down those stories. Nobody had ever cataloged them. Nobody had ever dug into them to see what was the truth and what was the myth and what were the lies. And so I figured out, hey, I've got this opportunity to do a capstone project. I've got this topic which nobody has ever really touched on before. And somebody told me I can't do it. So <laughs> I have to. Um, being a, a Holy Lander, I was uh, kind of privy to folks saying, oh, OK, we'll talk to you. And the Malone Area Heritage Museum was instrumental in being able to have that um, nexus of the folks I needed to talk to, as well as folks pointing me in the right direction. And then I spent a lot of time in this building going through old newspapers, starting about 1917 all the way through the mid-1930s, and going literally day by day looking for events that involved bootlegging and moonshining. And when I would get a tip as in, oh, this person uh, had a still bust around this month this year, then I would really scour things. Um, and we'll look at a few of those significant events that either I was given a copy of a newspaper article and someone said, oh, here you go and I would follow up on it, or I would stumble upon it and say, oh, this is interesting, this involved Pipe or one of the Holy Land communities. So that's the background. Uh, I spent about a year and a half doing this research project, um, 2009 to 2010. I originally published the article or the paper um, in 2010, and since then have kind of given this presentation, and every time I do it, I get a few more stories to add to it. So it's a very much a living, dynamic presentation my grandma will attest to this, and my mom as well, because I think they've been to almost every single one I've given. So every time, there's new material that gets added. Um, I always say, oh, I'm going to write an addendum. I'm going to update this paper or this presentation. Um, but uh, I, I usually don't have time for that. So um, a lot of it is word of mouth and memory and me jotting things down. In the, in the real world, I'm a PA. I work in general vascular surgery up in Green Bay at Aurora Bay here. So, uh, getting uh, to take my afternoon to come down here and talk about this is, is pretty cool for me. And it usually incites lots of conversation of, what, what are you going to do this afternoon? So, um, maybe we could have the fun ones. You bet. Be awesome. So, moonshine in the Holy Land. And when you bring up topics like moonshine, bootlegging, prohibition, people usually get a couple of images that pop into their mind. If I bring up moonshiner, you might picture something like this on your left. Popcorn Sutton, probably one of the most notorious moonshiners in American history, with his long, wispy beard. Oh yeah, there's screens on the side. Um, with his long, wispy beard, sitting there out in the mountains of Appalachia with his turn-up still off on the left of him, um, bubbling away at night near a creek. And that might be what you think of as a moonshiner. When you bring a bootlegger, you might picture something like this middle image, an old uh, souped-up Ford um, with extra uh, strong shocks to handle the extra load of all the booze that was being carried, racing down roads in the middle of the night trying to outrun the revenue agent. If you bring up Rum Runner, you might picture this image to your right. Boats off the coast, just outside the reach of the Coast Guard or the Navy, uh, sodden down with booze with their World War I Liberty airplane engines converted into boat engines so that they were faster than the Coast Guard ships. Sitting there waiting to have their booze cargo picked up for the thirsty Americans. And when we bring up Prohibition, this image is rather iconic because it captures really what Prohibition was in America. 
most importantly, it wasted a lot of good alcohol. That was the main thing about prohibition that we have to remember. But we had hardworking individuals who were just doing their job, pouring it down the drain. We had the prohibition agent here of uh, an, an extension of the federal government with not willing to get his hands dirty, but certainly willing to pose for a picture. And then in the background, local law enforcement really wanting nothing to do with this law they usually <coughs> didn't believe in or didn't have the money to enforce. So what is going to happen today? Well, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, and some of it hopefully is more entertaining than others, but hopefully most of it is educational and enriching. First off, I usually talk about what is the Holy Land, because uh, when I give this presentation in the Fond du Lac area, most people know what the Holy Land is, but when I've given it in other parts of the state, I've had people come up to me or act a little puzzled, and they say, oh, you're going to talk about moonshining and bootlegging in Israel. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me clarify what the Holy Land actually is which is a research topic in itself. We'll talk about how national prohibition and what happened in Wisconsin during prohibition really wasn't the first bout of a push for dryness in the state. Wisconsin had a pretty rich and tumultuous history in regards to temperance and anti-alcohol sentiment. We'll look at how did prohibition happen? What was the temperance movement like in America from basically the conception of the nation all the way through 1933, and then we'll look at why, why the Holy Land, what made that unique, what made that special, and then how it actually worked in the Holy Land, the, the logistics of it, and then I'll share interesting stories and things that I found along the way, as well as an audio clip of an interview of Louis Carls, who was a, a pretty big moonshiner himself. So, the Holy Land of Eastern Wisconsin is an area of Fond du Lac County, that Sheboygan County, that has some very unique features that makes it a research topic on a national scale. There are individuals who have actually devoted their PhD dissertations as well as courses to chain migration, which is literally, which is a term used to describe how the individuals who left Germany <coughs> settled in Wisconsin and why they picked this particular area and how it was very unique. The area of the Holy Land had some unique features. First off, it had a very strong, almost 100% German ancestry. It was almost as exclusively Roman Catholic. And it was developed in small localized communities, very similar to the types of communities those Germans left in Germany when they came to America. And each of them was distinctive, but yet they identified as part of a greater whole. So just looking at a map real quickly, in the Wisconsin Cartographers Guild, which is a group of map makers, their history, um, they chose to actually use the Holy Land as something unique to put in their book of um, maps. So Wisconsin's Holy Land, now this is a little bit debated about which uh, communities are actually uh, incorporated into the Holy Land and which aren't, but for our sake, the important part is we kind of have a core group of villages or communities uh, oftentimes with that German ancestry with a Roman Catholic church and a small community. So we have things like St. Peter, Mount Calvary, St. Cloud, St. Joe, Johnsburg with St. John the Baptist, Marytown, and all these communities with uh, pretty, uh, very similar start dates to when they were started, when their churches were built, and very similar in how they were constructed and how they were organized socially. The Holy Land itself, well, originally it was settled between the 1830s and the 1840s, and that group of original settlers communicated with folks back home in western Germany, specifically in the Eiffel region of western Germany. And what they said was, hey, there's a lot of land here. We have forests. We have marshes. This is a good place to live. You should come here. And because of the communication by the original settlers to that second wave, they came over in a second wave about between 1860 and 1870. And that sort of chain of an initial group communicating to a later group, and then another group coming over is called chain migration. And the, and the Holy Land of Wisconsin is a very classic example of that across the United States. Some of the unique features about the Holy Land uh, settlers was that they were primarily uh, agricultural in nature. They were farmers. And they came from the Eiffel or Western region of Germany. The interesting thing about this map 
is that I actually found it on a website for wind turbine company in Germany. And if you've ever been out to the Holy Land, you will find our wind turbines. Mm -hmm. So it's one of these kind of um, odd sort of correlations. But the Germans, uh, the, the folks who lived in the Eiffel region, things were not so good in the 1830s and subsequently into the 1850s and 60s. What they found was that they were having an economic depression, uh, harvests were not going so well, and there was some religious persecutions in that area. And so at that time, America was the place to go. It was expanding, and Wisconsin was the western frontier at that time. As they came in through initially through New York and traveled west, basically the Fond du Lac area was the western front at that time. And so this was where land was sold for relatively cheap. As you approach from the south off to the west, the land was relatively flat and easy to convert into agricultural into uh, farms and into fields uh, to be used for crops. On the east side, if you've been there, the ledge, it was heavily wooded, it had marshes and swamps, it wasn't thought to be as good of land. So it was, it was usually cheaper, but it was also not so uh, highly sought after. And as the Germans, which were immigrants at that time, which were not thought to be um, very popular people, they were offered this land first. And what the, what the Americans at that time didn't know was that Germans actually preferred heavily wooded, marshy, swampy areas <laughs> because they could drain those marshes and they had very rich farmland. They could cut down those trees and they had the wood to build their community. So it actually worked out rather nicely for them. And that's why the eastern side was settled in what we now know as, as the Holy Land. So the language that I'm going to use today, like things like moonshining and bootlegging and rum running and all these different things, they have specific meanings. So I'm just going to clarify them real quickly. So moonshine is a white liquor made from distilling a mash. Um, you'll hear things like white lightning. And a mash is a fermented solution made by mixing a sugar source, corn sugar, beet sugar, whatever, yeast, water, and occasionally a flavoring. And what happens is the yeast eats the sugar, and its waste product is ethanol, which is what we think of as alcohol that we consume in beer, wine, and hard liquors. What you're doing when you distill something is you're taking something that's roughly 10 to 15 percent alcohol, let's say, and increasing it to a higher amount. And that can vary from, let's say, 40 percent all the way up to 95 percent is about the highest you can get by distillation. There are various ways of using it, uh, or of making your mashes. There were rather cheap and straightforward and easy ways to do it, which resulted in a lower, or still does, results in a lower quality alcohol and lower quality product with more impurities, leading to usually not as good of a taste, and more importantly, a much more intense hangover. So, if you had a good, a good uh, moonshiner, they knew to use certain products to get a higher quality sort of product out at the end. Thus, they could charge more for it. As prohibition progressed, those higher quality products were oftentimes watered down or, or um, diluted so that there could be increased profits. Um, sugar back was that very straightforward measure. Sweet mash is where you use corn or some grain, and it gives off a very sweet sort of odor and has a taste to it. And that generally takes more time and has a higher quality product. The moonshiner is the one who actually performs that distilling and brewing process. A bootlegger is the one who transports illegal alcohol by land, and a rum runner is someone who transports it by water. These terms are often used interchangeably. Um, and you could have, in, in, it was very common that your moonshiner or bootlegger would be the exact same person. A revenue agent was someone who worked for usually something like the IRS or the Treasury Department that was attempting to bust someone for evading taxes on their still. We'll talk a little bit more about the history there. Once we cross the line of the 18th Amendment, and we have the Prohibition Bureau, you had prohibition agents who were attempting to bust people for subverting or breaking the 18th Amendment and the law. So we had two different sort of agents who were both pursuing the moonshiner and continue to over time. There's many different nicknames for moonshine. So Elkie and Moon were the two that I saw most commonly in newspapers in the Fond du Lac area during Prohibition. And um, Elkie was usually a term reserved for very high 180 or greater proof alcohol. 
The other terms that you would hear, um, maybe not so much in, in, in uh, the Fond du Lac area, but on a national scale, were White Lightning and Mountain Dew. And those have specific names for, as well, as do all the other ones up there. They were functions as codes, because you couldn't just walk up to someone if you didn't know them and ask for a jar of moonshine. Likewise, if you were the proprietor of the moonshine business, you wanted to know who was cool, who you could trust, and who you couldn't. So you would use different codes so that you had that establishment of trust. White lightning originated from the concept that, back in the day, there were two forms of light. There was white lightning and red lightning. The idea was is that red lightning, when it struck the ground, would start a fire, but you could put that flame out with water. With white lightning, lightning would strike the ground and there, that fire would burn so hot there's nothing you could do to extinguish it. And if you've ever drank something greater than 180 proof, you will, ex you will experience something in your belly that's akin to a burning that will not stop. <laughs> so, for, this is not meant to be an instructional course. <laughs> but, uh, anyone get any ideas? Although, thanks to the Discovery Channel and National Geographic, Moonshine Show, uh, none of this is really uh, much of a secret anymore. Um, and, and I gave this talk at uh, Fond du Lac and New Holstein High Schools, and I had to have a huge slide before this that said, do not go home and try this. For the love of God, do not go home and tell mom and dad that some guy came to school and thought you ought to make moonshine. And for science class, you have to do it now. Um, so distillation works like this. Basically, you have your mash, which is, let's say, 10% alcohol, and you have a heating surface flame of some kind, or a hot stone in this case, and you heat that mash up, and alcohol will boil, it will become a vapor more quickly at a lower temperature than water. So you get an alcohol steam. That alcohol steam is then pushed through a series of pipes into sometimes a thumper keg, but essentially ending in a coil of tubing that goes through a bucket of cool water. And what will happen is that as that alcohol-rich gas travels through that tubing, in there it will start to condense on the inside of that tube because it's in that bucket of cold water. And coming out the side, you will have your higher concentrated alcohol of, of let's say, 40, 60 percent, or whatever the case may be, ethanol. So we got to look at the history. So prohibition didn't just happen. It wasn't like one day. America said, hey, you know what's going to be a good idea? Let's just get rid of alcohol. It didn't happen that way. It actually took decades for America to get to a point politically, um, economically, and societally for it to agree that getting rid of alcohol would maybe work. And this was hugely debated, and it took a long time to happen. And these gals here are part of the temperance movement which became incredibly strong and incredibly powerful as it swept across the nation after the Civil War. But even before the Civil War, before the temperance movement even started, alcohol in America was a hotly debated topic. And following the Revolutionary War, the federal government, the US government at that time, was rather weak, and it had a lot of debt. And it needed to figure out how to pay that debt off. So it instituted, Alexander Hamilton's great idea was that he said, look, let's put a tax on stills based on the size, or if someone is uh, distilling a lot um, and they make alcohol as a source of business, let's put a tax on how much they make. And we will use this revenue to pay off our war debt. Now, that wasn't exactly um, very popular, especially <laughs> in Pennsylvania where Scots and the Irish had settled, and they had fought in this war, and they had come back to their farms, and they commonly distilled at home, because that was just very common practice, especially when you had extra grain you couldn't store. And suddenly now, they were being expected to pay taxes on that. So they launched the Whiskey Rebellion. And the Whiskey Rebellion took place in Pennsylvania. Uh, groups of people rose up, they were gonna go to uh, the Capitol and tell the federal government, no, this isn't going to happen. George Washington led troops, the only time the president has functioned as the actual commander-in-chief and led troops, and quelled this rebellion. And with this, two things became very clear for America. 
Number one, the federal government could make laws, it could make taxes, and it was going to enforce them. And then the second part was to reach a compromise. George Washington and the federal government at that time said, look, this will be a temporary tax. We'll place this tax on stills and alcohol, and when the debt from the war is paid off, we'll get rid of it. And that's what they did. Once the debt was paid off, the tax was gone, everybody was happy. And then that became rather commonplace. The War of 1812 and the Civil War happened, they did the exact same thing. We're going to place a temporary tax on alcohol and stills. We're going to use that money to pay off the war debt. And after that, we're going to be done with that tax. As I said, it basically said that if you have a still, you have to pay a tax on that. Or if you're producing alcohol on a regular basis, you have to pay based on production. And this was enforced by the Treasury Department, and that's where the term <laughs> revenue agent came from. These individuals were enforcing <laughs> laws for people that were not paying their taxes on their stills. And that is essentially still to this day following prohibition how things work. If you have a, a still, it's not illegal to own the still because you can distill water, you can distill vinegar, you can distill essential spirits. But if you light a flame to a still with the intention of distilling alcohol or ethanol you are, and you have not registered that still and are not paying taxes on it, then you are evading taxes and you are breaking the law. And that's, that's the law that you break. That's why making moonshine is illegal to this day. You can ferment, as in make beer and wine, or cider, that's totally legal, to certain volume quantities per household, but you cannot distill for that reason. Following all this, we have the progressive movement. And a portion of the progressive movement was the temperance movement. And that essentially started as a small group of individuals that said, look, America and this, this group of friends, we have a real problem with alcohol. And we need to cut down on our consumption because it's the right thing to do. This was very religiously motivated, um, which, is very, which is still true today. And it started in the 1830s. It gained momentum following the Civil War because there was this overwhelming idea with Reconstruction that, look, America has gone through its very tough period with this, this horrible Civil War, and now we can move forward. We can be a greater union. We can be this utopia that we have sought for so long. And part of that was getting rid of alcohol, because there was a significant abuse, abuse problem in America at that time. The progressive movement and the temperance movement was, uh, or the temperance movement, excuse me, was specifically a single issue party. They had made three major players. The first one was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The second one was the Anti-Saloon League. And the third one was the Sons of Temperance. And these were three different organizations whose pure only purpose was to get rid of alcohol in America. They were not overly concerned about race equality. They were not worried about women's suffrage. They were worried about alcohol in America. And that made them very strong. It made them very focused. But as time progressed, this, uh, these groups became unfortunately rather anti-immigrant, specifically anti-German, because beer was associated as German, and therefore Germans were bad because they drank beer. It became very Catholic because at that time there was a theory that, or I'm sorry, not a theory, but a stereotype that all Germans were Catholic. It became anti-Semitic because many of the distilleries were owned by Jews at that time. So it became very anti-Semitic. And it, it fe fed into this idea of isolationism. America doesn't have the drinking problem. It's all those immigrants that are coming here. Look at those Germans. Look at those Irish. They're the ones causing all the trouble here. So if we can get rid of alcohol and control the immigrants, then everything will be fine in America. So there were a lot of legislative maneuvers at both local, state, and federal levels that allowed dries, those who wanted to get rid of alcohol in America, to gain control and power. So how did prohibition come about? Well, as I said, it didn't pop up overnight. There were a couple of things that had to happen before national prohibition took place. And by the time national prohibition did take place, there were quite a few states that were dry themselves. So this wasn't something super um, uh, that just became law of the land overnight. There were many states that already had dry laws. But what happened um, specifically was the Lever Act of 1917 creates what I call functional prohibition. And this was a response to the US entry into World War I. And what the Lever Act said was that if you have a food stuff, anything that can be used for food for the war effort, you cannot use that to make alcohol with because then you're pulling food away from our soldiers, which is probably not a good idea. 
So there was kind of this functional prohibition, because unless you were going <coughs> to ferment a chair or your sofa, you're going to have a hard time making alcohol out of anything that wasn't probably going to be food anyway. The 18th Amendment came by because of a couple of very influential drives <coughs> in Congress, and it was passed in 1917. Now, as compromise happens in government until late, what happened was the dries and the wets had this constant bickering back and forth. And the wets said, look, what about all those people who work in breweries? What about all those coopers who make the barrels? What about all the people who transport that? Suddenly overnight, you're going to make them have no job? So what the dries said was, look, from the moment things get ratified, um, or once the, the bill passes, you'll have one year of kind of a grace period for all those people that are going to lose their jobs to find new jobs. And that was how the compromise was meant for the 18th Amendment to go through. It went into effect after a veto by um, President Wilson. It was overridden by Congress. And it went into effect January 17, 1920. Now, the 18th Amendment itself doesn't really have any teeth. It just says you can't make, transport, um, distribute or sell intoxicating liquors. It doesn't get really any penalties. So this gentleman right here, Andrew Volstead, um, came by and said, oh, I'll put my name on the bill. That will be the teeth of it. That will enforce the 18th Amendment. If we fast forward 13 years, the repeal of the 18th Amendment is essentially stated in the 21st Amendment, the shortest <laughs> of the amendments and it took place in 1933. It was signed very quickly by FDR, it's called the Beer Bill, and um, alcohol was allowed to be consumed once again in America. <coughs> After Prohibition, power was given to the states and local jurisdictions about if they wanted to stay dry. So that's where we hear about dry counties um, and dry um, towns and that sort of stuff. The 18th Amendment itself said one year from ratification, uh, no manufacture, sale, uh, or transportation of intoxicating liquors. Because it couldn't say alcoholic. Alcohol has many variations of it and it has industrial purposes. Likewise, there was medicinal alcohol. So the prescription for medicinal whiskey went up by like 16,000% <laughs> overnight. So they had to be very careful about how they worded this and therefore for beverage purposes. So medicinal whiskey fit the bill, but it was actually a, a bit of a bureaucratic mess for physicians to prescribe it. And I can't remember, the, there's, I've just started reading a book um, about prohibition, and uh, there was one physician who they had calculated if, based on his signature on all these prescriptions, he would have had to have written like 200 prescriptions per hour for five years to actually have prescribed as much alcohol as was his name, was, or as much as his name was intoned to. So. In Wisconsin specifically, before things took place on a national scale, Wisconsin itself went through a huge battle about uh, the role of alcohol in its state. So there were three key players, the Sons of Temperance and the Yankees. The Yankees were the original settlers of Wisconsin. They came from, the New, from New York and the New England area, and they settled Wisconsin, specifically in the Kenosha Racine area. And they were the first ones to really develop Wisconsin's government, um, the grid system for how the state is divided, and um, uh, the other portion of Wisconsin settlers initially were German immigrants, as we're all very aware of. And so we had these three major players, the Sons of Temperance being a formal organization that sought to make Wisconsin dry. Essentially, from the first meeting of the Senate, of uh, Wisconsin Senate, and the gentleman who introduced a dry bill that said, from the moment the state goes forward, it should be dry. It failed. But there was eventually a compromise, and the first licensing, um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the first licensing sort of um, system in the United States took place in Wisconsin, where uh, if you wanted to sell alcohol, you had to have a license to do such. And Wisconsin was the first place to do that. So Wisconsin um, also tried something like a bond, which basically said that if you were going to sell alcohol, you had to carry a $1,000 bond. And if you sold alcohol to someone and they caused damage to somebody's property or uh, their employer lost wages or some sort of productivity, they could come to you as the proprietor of a saloon, let's say, and say, look, uh, that person wrecked $500 worth of equipment. I want to be um, compensated for that 
inconvenience for that damage, and you have, would take money out of your bond to pay them for it. Unfortunately, there was no rules that that bond had to re be replenished after the initial $1,000 was gone. And likewise, there was nothing that prevented you from having your buddy say that he had $1,000 worth of damage to his property, and you guys split the money. So there was a lot of corruption that took place early on. So basically, America, Wisconsin, that didn't really work very well. And there was a push for a dry bill. There was the thought that, oh, let's, let's not have alcohol in the state led to sweeping um, violence across Milwaukee. And actually, the um, mayor of Milwaukee's home was burned at the time. Uh, there was huge riots in the street. And if you read the German newspapers at the time versus the English-speaking newspapers at the time, they tell very, very different accounts of what happened there. The German newspapers usually talk about people uh, peacefully protesting, looking for some sort of reason and some sort of conversation about this issue. Uh, versus the English-speaking ones said that this was a, essentially terrorism, that there was um, uh, riots in the street, and there was chaos everywhere, and people were dying. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting media hype at the time. But essentially, there is some compromise in the fact that at this point, there had been breweries established, and Wisconsin's economy was probably going to have something to do with brewing going on. So they said, look, first off, we can't control supply and demand, a lesson. Uh, America as a whole was <coughs> sometime later, and the brewing industry was bringing in uh, jobs and is bringing in a lot of tax revenue for the state of Wisconsin. So, well, we can't really get rid of that. So, they reached a compromise with the licensing law, which I spoke about earlier. There was a popular vote in 1853. It was pretty corrupt in how it was executed, but the dries at the time said, oh, the state will be dry. Um, but Governor Barstow, in his wisdom, vetoed that and said, no, we're, we're not going to have statewide dryness. So big deal, so what? How does that tie into the Holy Land? How does this really fit with, um, what, what makes it unique about the Holy Land? Well, there's a couple of things. Two major things, are there's these macro factors, things on a national level, national trends which help predispose the Holy Landers, and then there are micro factors, elements within, oh thank you. Um, elements within the Holy Land that actually made it possible for the um, production of moonshine to take place and the distribution, distribution of that moonshine uh, from there. Likewise, if we look at the time frame, there was a significant economic necessity for it. This is a you get what you incentivize sort of thing. And when the, when the money was there for moonshine and bootlegging to take place, it certainly was going to take place. And likewise, it was a thrilling kind of exciting thing to do. So the macro factors, the things that happen on a national level, if we look at prohibition, well, it was anti-German, it was anti-Catholic, and it was obviously anti-alcohol. Well, in the Holy Land, you find Germans who are Catholic, who like alcohol, <laughs> and you're going to have some trouble. So they not only enjoyed alcohol as part of their culture, but they also had, if you look at the plat books and the maps from, um, you know, 1900 to 1940 in the Holy Land, every community pretty much had, uh, um, every community had a brewery of some kind. So there was an economic component to there as well as a cultural component to it as well. The micro factors, the thing that existed in the Holy Land itself that made it possible for all this was most importantly the railroad. And something we don't think of today, but roads were not what they um, are today. Transportation didn't exist how we think of it today. Railroads were extremely vital. So it allowed for sugar to come in, and it allowed for shine to be shipped out. Likewise, you had empty cheese factories, which um, doesn't make sense initially until you talk to some folks who were children during Prohibition and grew up in cheese factories, because that's what happened during the Depression, and that's the only place they could live. The reality was that to make moonshine, you need large vats, you need cisterns, you need piping, you need pumps, you need heating sources. What do you need to make moonshine? You need all of those. So, what the moonshiners would do is they would go into an abandoned cheese factory and they would retrofit a few things and they had a huge functional operation right there. Easy, ready to go, set up, and easy, easy to conceal as well. We had an agrarian society so those of you who have grown up on farms, you know that there's busy times of the year and then there's maybe a little more lax, lax times of the year. 
And if you have a large family and you don't need everybody helping on the farm, you can send them down the road to help on the still. And they're going to make some cash and they're going to bring that back to help the family out. From an economic necessity, we often think about the Great Depression starting around 1929. But in Wisconsin specifically, uh, and across the United States, the agricultural depression started in 1921. And this was due to a surplus of goods following World War I. During World War I started, I'm sorry, well, during World War I, America was selling its foodstuffs to Europe for the war. So the, there was a lot of incentive. Prices were very high. When America entered the war, things went even better because farmers could make money, they could finally get ahead, and so they started to buy more equipment, take out loans, buy land. But after the war ended, there was suddenly a surplus of goods, and food prices plummeted, and so created the agricultural depression, starting eight years before the Great Depression resulted from the collapse of our financial industry. And so we had a system where cash was king, it really was only used for very necessary um, transactions, and barter system was very common. And moonshining was all cash, so it offered this great incentive for folks to be involved. The Holy Land, the train, now I, this is me drawing on a map, so please <laughs> bear with me, but the train came from Klondike and went to Sheboygan in the grand scheme of things. They had some specific stops at Calvary Station, um, Calgary Station, St. Cloud, Malone, and carried on from there. And so the, the railroad itself, which could carry huge quantities of whatever, uh, whatever materials you wanted, was running right through the middle of the Holy Land. So what made moonshining and bootlegging in the Holy Land typical? Well, they made moonshine and drank it, which was incredibly common across America at that time. Um, there was universal dismissal of the 18th Amendment. And if you read the newspaper, it comes from the time and those who were busted as moonshiners or bootleggers, they pretty much said, look, that law, that, that, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not playing by those rules. And when it was passed, it was always thought of as prohibition is for them. The rich would say it's for the poor. The poor would say, no, the rich are the ones who control the government. They're the ones who passed it. Prohibition is for the rich. The Americans said, oh, this is for the immigrants. The immigrants said, no, this is for the Americans. The prohibition was always a law of them. It was never about the people. Uh, no one felt like it applied to them. So there were various phases of, um, of uh, recognition of the law that took place. And so initially, most of Americans made a pretty good effort at this. Ah, we'll give this a try. We'll try this no alcohol thing. It's a blow over. And then all of a sudden, there was major illegal importing because people said, eh, I kind of like my alcohol, I want that back. <laughs> then there was an attempt by enforcement, usually at a federal level, and then at a state, and then a local level. There was no um, appropriation of funds <coughs> from, a, uh, from a federal standpoint for any state or local entities to enforce this law. So the Prohibition Bureau existed, and the FBI would enforce this law, but in the state of Wisconsin, or in Fond du Lac County, State of Wisconsin and Fond du Lac County had appropriate funds to actually enforce prohibition. And so at a time such as the Depression, when there wasn't a lot of money to go around, they weren't going to spend it on laws that were highly controversial and they didn't want to enforce. And finally, after those enforcement efforts would fail, everything would get awash with booze. <laughs> there was universal dismissal amongst Catholics and Germans. And that was primarily because they felt like it was a law picking on them. And so for them, they said, um, that's not a law for us. So what made it unique? Well, prior to Prohibition, there were definitely breweries in all the Holy Land communities. There's no way to deny that. But there weren't any distilleries. There wasn't a single one in any of the Holy Land communities. There was potentially one in Dodyville. Um, that was something a bit of word of mouth but I've never actually found any evidence that it existed. The closest distillery was actually in Plymouth. So distilling, by nature of it, was a foreign art to the Holy Landers. Beer was very commonly accepted and consumed in Holy Land communities, but whiskeys, hard liquors generally were not. And then during Prohibition, we see this exotic practice of distilling introduced, and it was conducted on a massive scale. Um, in general, when you look at how was moonshine made on a national level during Prohibition? 
what happened was is people who owned distilleries before would pack up their distilleries and move them to Canada and they would distill there and then sneak it into America or in cities especially <laughs> warehouses would be converted into massive still operations the concept of using milk um, um, cheese factories and barns in this way was um, really unique and, and I haven't found any evidence um, that it happened anywhere else in America. The use of, um, oh, sorry, anyway, that was a lot of so a couple of specific <laughs> operations. So the Malone operation um, was one that uh, Bill Casper was kind enough to share with me and a couple other folks talked to me about. And it, it ran like a regular business. So here's how things would work. Um, if you haven't been to Malone, there's a museum. And there's a gate co-op. That's about it. But the train would run through um, kind of in an east-west manner. And uh, seven, that's not seven hills road, county W, north-south. And the, how it would work was the train would come into town and it would stop. When the train stopped, there was always a designated car that was full of sugar and would be conveniently unlocked. Trucks would back up to this car and they would open it and they would unload as much sugar as they could possibly before the train started to move again. Those trucks would then start and head south to this cheese factory where in the front of the building there were one or two vats of cheese going, but then there was a false wall. And behind that were multiple vats of mash going. They were using that sugar and yeast to make a mash. Then that mash was transported along a trail to a farm and a barn that had a massive still in it where they would actually distill the moonshine. This um, farm was kind of set back and wasn't easily accessible. And since, you know, this is 1930s, there aren't tons of cars that would go up and down these roads. So there were usually lookouts in place. How they would convert a barn is they would either tear out the mow and make it into one big room, if you will, and they would have a massive still that would be as big as the barn was, and that's how they would run their operation. The other way they would do it, and as they did in Malone, was that they had a milking parlor. You walked into the base, there'd be cows, there'd be a normal farm operation. You could even go up to the hay mow. There would be a hay mow there, but then there was a false wall, and behind that was a big still the big roof uh, um, opening in the roof and that is where the exhaust would go out and there would be a trap door from below that would allow you to get up into that false mound where the still was so you don't have to take any of this from me really <laughs> I have an interview of a guy who did this <laughs> um, some of his family's here which is phenomenal I'm really glad you can make it um, and when I when I started this project, I didn't have really primary sources. I didn't have people who were actually moonshiners or bootleggers at the time. I had lots of people who said, well, I was a kid at the time. Here's some stories. Here's what I saw. Here's people, that sort of thing, which is great, which is wonderful. I love to collect that. But to have that person know I was there, I did it, was a little difficult. So um, one day at the Malone Museum, someone came up to me and said, oh, I have this interview with Louis Carls. And if you could talk to one guy, he's the guy you want to talk to. And someone had said, um, the interview was from the 70s, correct? That's when the tape was played at the high school. Okay. I don't so know if that, when it was. When it was actually done, but, so I didn't know until now who did the interview, I just knew that it was Louis Carl's on it, so I had kind of a rough time frame on it. Um, but it's a great, about 25 minute interview of him with all kinds of stories about the different operations that he was involved in or ran. And it's really, really interesting. And in this interview, he talks about how he produced Moonshine from 1930 to 1935. Um, it was located at multiple locations across eastern Wisconsin, all the way down to like the Horicon area. He sold to either New London or Chicago, and he functioned independent of Al Capone. He talks extensively about how bribery was extremely common, and that's how you got away with what you did. And he was shot in the back once, specifically at a raid on the Malone operation. And so he was a lookout at that time, or he was outside, and they were raided by Prohibition agents. He was shot in the back, he was taken to a hospital in Fond du Lac, he says, and he walked out of there two days later, 
never paid his bill, never got a fine until two years later when they found him and he, he had to go to court. And he says he paid, I think it was a $200 fine. Um, pretty interesting. Um, he, uh, so how they did it, and this is the really fascinating thing, is he talks about like logistically how they did it. So they had large wooden cisterns, which if you're not familiar with, they're like kind of basically big wooden buckets. And they would fill that with water. In each vat they would put 200 pounds of sugar, four pounds of yeast, and they would have a large distilling column that was 35 feet tall and 36 inches in diameter. And they would have a, a kettle at the bottom of that that they would that was sealed, and they would boil the mash, and then the alcohol vapor would travel up that and through it and get more concentrated, going from let's say 10% alcohol to 50% alcohol. The worm bucket itself, which was full of cold water with that tubing going through it, so that the alcohol would condense down, was six feet by four feet. So we we're talking really really big things here. Took 13 to 15 guys to run each operation. And the interviewer asks, oh, were you worried about the law? And he says, no, you weren't really worried about the law. You could usually pay them off. As soon as you started an operation, somebody would show up, you'd give them money. A couple days later, somebody would show up, you'd give them money. And that's how it just worked. You didn't really have to worry about that too much. What we did worry about was hijackers. So he talks about after you had all your booze loaded up into 50-gallon drums, and I think they, each night they had about 24 50-gallon drums of 160-proof alcohol, small, you know. They would load this up onto big trucks and they would transport it to either, usually New London. And I'll get back to why that is um, odd, um, but it makes sense in a second. Um, and then you would worry about hijackers. Two guys would be transporting that alcohol to the New London area. And he talks about one night how they got a hijacker jumped them and they were able to overpower him and he drops them off at the police station. <laughs> and he says, and the interviewer says, well, why did you take him to the police station? And weren't you guys, you know, with this load of moonshine? And the guys, uh, and Louis Carl's replies, well, they were all in on it too. They were our buddies. They knew us. So we just took this guy who tried to hijack us and dropped him off. Um, so I'm going to play a clip from the uh, clip from the interview that talks about kind of what made this really really um, unique in the whole thing. Wisconsin, but he was independent of him. 
the New London thing was always a mystery to me. I never could figure out this connection until about six months ago I got an email from a gentleman who saw the posting for this presentation when I gave it last time that got handed to him at Christmas or something. <clears throat> and he said, oh, I've got some information about moonshining up in the New London area. Are you interested? And I thought, sure. I mean, I'm not going to say no to talking to somebody. So I meet with him. And, I, and he starts telling me about the New London operation. And some of the names that come up in the newspapers at that time were the same names of the individuals who lived in the New London area. And they, it was a group of brothers, and they were basically the major operation. And what they did was they were the ones who provided the supplies. They would provide the sugar, the yeast, the materials to set up all these stills, all these operations. And then they got, I can't remember what percentage of the moonshine that was produced back. And then they would sell that. And so they were the, the ones behind the scenes. And, and so Louis tied into that group as one of the arms of his, their operation. He was one of the guys who would take the materials, the sugar, the yeast, whatever it was, through the railroad because they owned a company where they would have boxcars to themselves and they would transport all these materials on the train without anybody really suspecting it. And these other people out in these areas would acquire all these materials and the kickback was a percentage of the moonshine that was produced. And this gentleman goes on to tell me about an operation in the New London area that was identical to the Malone operation. And I thought, how crazy. And then we started to compare our notes and that's how everything tied together. That's why his moonshine was going to New London or Chicago, because he was giving back to the guys who supplied him with all the sugar, the yeast, and all the materials. So that was really an interesting thing, and you know, five, six years after starting this project, as I said, it's very dynamic. I'm always kind of learning new stuff about it. But the big thing that he brings up in this interview that was paramount to this project and the thesis was that it wasn't so much the actual moonshine that created the money, it was the operations themselves. And it was the moonshine indirectly. So the moonshine and their operations to make it in the Holy Land was one of the very few forms of external cash flow at that time. Without the moonshiners, many merchants would not have been able to survive. So the coal sellers, he says they used about five tons of coke, which was like a smokeless coal, uh, per week on each operation, so they were making money. The train, because they had extra freight and hundreds of pounds of sugar and coal that they had to transport, were making money off of that. The local service stations, because each of these operations <coughs> needed to get fuel for their vehicles, oil, repairs to whatever they had. The local farmers, because they kept corn prices inflated, but more importantly, sugar beets were a very common product in the Holy Land at that time. And so we don't think of sugar beets anymore, but that was the primary source for granular sugar in America at that time. So it kept those prices inflated. Likewise, they rented out their barns, or they might lend them their service, their machinery, that sort of thing, uh, in exchange for cash. And then the neighbors were often kept uh, paid to keep their mouth shut. So everybody was benefiting their money. It's a value of oral history because without this interview, my whole research project would have been kind of been based on more uh, word of mouth anecdotal things, but his interview allowed everything to come together and allowed me to publish this paper and give this presentation today. So the interesting piece, the interesting pieces is kind of stuff I found along the way. So um, this is this is more the fun part. This is probably the part people enjoy the most. But there's Moonshiner's Cave, which was originally the Spring Brewery. Located on the ledge, uh, somewhere up along the women's prison. And it's this cave here, it's photographed and with the photographic history of Fondalac County. And um, it's limestone, and it was a cool place. It's where beer was lagered and aged. There was a stone that kind of sat like a tabletop that people would go out for picnics and that sort of thing. During Prohibition, um, there was a moonshine operation that ran out of it, and that's why the walls are black with soot. I haven't actually been there. There's a couple of people who tell me they know where it is, um, but I guess it's all boarded up, and it's actually on the uh, women's prison grounds now, so you have to get kind of special permission to go see it. Um, but it's still there. 
Um, the, there's an interview with an ATF agent. He says, moonshiners and bootleggers have a PhD in their own because they're very creative. They came up with ways to avoid being caught in so many different ways. In the Holy Land, uh, and in interviews and in newspaper articles, I found no shortage of this uh, uh, either. There was something called wrapping a barn. So you, many of you are probably familiar with the barn, and in between the boards there's small slits. And so if you had a still running at night, and you had lights going on in there or a fire burning, it's going to be pretty obvious to somebody driving by that there's something going on at 2 in the morning. And uh, that's going to probably create an issue for you. So what they would do is they would wrap the entire inside of a barn with cardboard or some sort of material, tar paper uh, was the other one, to block light from going out. And so there's a couple of barns that people would say, yeah, I, I went in somebody's barn and the whole inside was covered up and they thought, well, why would that be? And that was to prevent light from escaping at night. Second one was they would use various lookouts. There was an operation near St. Peter where there was a dead tree in a field and one of the lookout stations was in that tree. And so if they saw somebody coming down the road, they could run down the, and get word back to the still. There was a gentleman I interviewed whose dad, would use, they would use thrashers. And so thrashers aren't very common anymore, but um, the inside of that is all hollow. It's, it's a big, meant for holding water to boil. Well, these were manufactured in various points on eastern Wisconsin, and they'd be transported all over the United States. And the key was that at that time, prohibition agents, law enforcement would look for vehicles that were really weighed down and shouldn't be. Like, you know, a car goes by and it's really got its back end down, what are they hauling? So, but if a big, big uh, truck or a train had a bunch of thrashers on it, that was already a really heavy load. And if it had a couple hundred gallons of that, uh, moonshine in it, nobody's going to know the difference. So that's what they do, did, was they would fill these up either at the factory or on the way to the destination to transport hundreds of gallons of moonshine undetected in thrasher boilers. The river dumps are some very entertaining stories that I got some, from some family stories. And they go just like you're imagining. A still would get busted. The prohibition agents, law enforcement, would dump the booze into the rivers. Rivers run through pastures. Cows are out in those pastures. No. Cows start drinking that water. And suddenly the cows are all laying down, <laughs> mounting each other. They don't want to come back in for milking in the evening. <laughs> so there's a very entertaining story of one where um, a gentleman was a, a child and they had to get the stone boat out and go out and haul each cow back individually. <laughs> um, so those are pretty entertaining. At the end of the story, he's like, that was a really hard day's work, but um, it's probably why we had such good milk and cheese in those days. <laughs> um, and there was this uh, symbiotic relationship that existed. So uh, there's one uh, about a family that had a farm with a cheese factory on the property and they had a turnaround and uh, it was near St. Peter, and the, there, it was very common for a bootlegger to be chased by the police down one of these roads, and the bootleggers would come in quickly behind a big mound of dirt or pull, I can't remember which one, and the, pro or the law enforcement would drive by and they would get away with it. But one night they came around too quickly, and they wrecked a piece of machinery with the, um, the cheese factory. And the young, the, the guy, the gentleman who was interviewed was a child at the time. He said, I've never, I never saw my dad that scared in, in his life. He was just trembling, go, thinking of going out in there and talking to these bootleggers. And he goes out, there's a short, short exchange, and the dad comes back in and uh, he's got some money and he says, well, they said they're going to take care of it and um, gave me some money and we'll, I think we'll be okay. And sure enough, by the next morning, everything was fixed and fine. And so there was this little bit of a symbiotic relationship of if you guys take care of us, we'll take care of you, which was very, very common at that time, basically for survival. There were a couple of stories that I ran across um, that, uh, this one I ran across just by chance. So the, the Moon Trial of 1922, and this was really like the first big story that took <coughs> place in Fond du Lac County regarding prohibition, <coughs> beyond act, the actual prohibition starting. So it happened, it involved a gentleman by the name of Peter Romick, and he rented a farm about a mile east of Pike. He had a small pot still on his stove, and he was, he was producing enough moonshine to get drunk himself, 
Um, the really sad part was that his wife had tuberculosis and they had four children. And he, they were receiving money. There was no welfare at that time. So there was um, a, a kind of a, a fund set up at the county level to help folks out at, uh, in this scenario. And he was taking those funds and then using it to make moonshine um, and really abusing the system. He wasn't really distributing or selling anything. And so it was really sad because he goes to jail, um, the kids get sent to an orphanage, and the, the wife dies a short time later. So it was very sad. Um, but the important thing here is that he wasn't from the Holy Land, he was from Campbellsport. <laughs> <laughs> That joke doesn't work anywhere else. <laughs> I used it at the State of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Historical Society presentation I gave a couple of years ago, and there was like two people that laughed. <laughs> so, um, more entertaining, more kind of um, not so depressing. Uh, the Cap Welling bust. So, some of you may remember Cap Welling's Roadhouse out by the Cheetah Pebbles area, and um, this was a popular place. Um, it was an establishment, and during Prohibition, it was just kind of a general, um, it, was a, it wasn't a saloon, it didn't, he didn't sell alcohol up front, but it was a, a place where music would be played, and people would gather. Um, but, but at the same time, the, the Crab Orchard Whiskey Distillery in Plymouth, and they had a warehouse there, was, it was raided. Someone busted into it, stole loads and loads and loads of Crab Orchard Whiskey, and the police at that time were following the distribution of this stuff for years. And one of the places they found a bunch of it was at Cap Welling. And it was basically, there was a tip, they went there, he had a bunch in his basement, but the key was that it was just the containers. Uh, when he tasted it, when other people tasted it, he said, this isn't Crab Orchard, this is some garbage. They're just using the wrapper, the, the bottle, to try to sell it as Crab Orchard. Um, the primary reason he got busted was because the federal government at that time was making a big raid in eastern Wisconsin. It wasn't local law enforcement that was really involved in it. To the point of when, he had, when the federal agents took him to the courthouse in Fond du Lac, the, town sheriff at the, or the county sheriff at the time said, just go home. <laughs> Come back, pay your fine, and it'll be just fine. Um, and there's other articles, uh, stories throughout 1924, where they find areas with crab orchard whiskey. And the reason they were really being aggressive about it was because out by St. Cloud area, there was a party um, and a bunch of people got sick off of it. So they were trying to find out who was actually selling it, who was doing this switcheroo on them, and so that they could kind of bust them and prevent more people from getting ill. The Marytown bust is an interesting one. Um, Sheriff Van de Zander was going out to Marytown to serve a civil court notice. And when he got to town, he was told, hey, there's some moonshining and bootlegging going in, on in this area. And he was talking to some people, and he observed a guy with a horse and cart out in a field going in a circle. <laughs> he thought, that's, that's odd. So he commandeers a snow flyer goes up to the gentleman and says, um, what's in your cart? He says, well, I don't know. Uh, I had another guy come up to me, tell me to go in a circle till he left town, and then he was going to come back and pay me. So the sheriff says, well, let's take a look. And there were 500 gallons of mash ready to run. So realizing that this gentleman probably wasn't totally oblivious to this, he said, look, if you show me where the real operation is, I will let you go. So they take, he takes him to a fence, uh, fence line, this is winter, they dig up a big still, the sheriff dumps the, the mash out, takes the still back to Fond du Lac, and says, you know, there's no reason to charge this guy, he was just kind of a Ponzi in this scheme, and they go on their way. Um, there is also a talk of, there's also, I, so I didn't say where that specifically took place or on any other names other than the sheriffs, um, but in the Marytown area there were two kind of operations, one of which was in this area, this dip of County Double H, this is all swamped in here in Marsh, um, there was a fairly good sized operation, and um, Kathy Rarick, Bertram Butts, my grandma, 
she grew up on a farm right about here. And so she told me about how uh, her dad, my great grandpa, was one of the lookouts for an operation down in this marsh. And basically, he would watch for cars to be coming down double H, and if there were, he would go alert the moonshiners and they would shut down the operation. There's also another person uh, who told me that there is um, still in this area, but I haven't found any eyewitnesses or anyone who could give me specific locations. Um, but they do, they do, I've also been told that there is a still buried out there somewhere. So if anybody's got spare time and they want to go walk around the swamp, <laughs> just go ahead and let me know if you find anything. Um, so the interesting case of Gregor Nice, I'm hearing muttering, so people probably know that name. Yeah. <laughs> so Gregor Nice uh, was a gentleman who played a very dangerous game. He, uh, his, his name comes into the newspapers in February of 1932, on February 13th. And his backstory was he was an insurance salesman from Mount Calvary. Um, and his family was the nice bottling, not the nice brewing company in Calvary Station. And he played a very dangerous game. He posed as a federal agent. And what he would do is he would go around to known still operations. He would tell them that he was a prohibition agent. He would take the bribe and then he would carry on with his life. Now he did apply to be a prohibition agent and he took the exam, but he failed it. So he wasn't a prohibition agent. And the Milwaukee office had no, they had records that he took the exam, but he was not one of their agents. That didn't stop him from going around and taking hefty bribes. In February of 1932, there were two other gentlemen who did very similar things, um, one of which would, was found with a massive, a gunshot wound to the back of the right side of the head, he survived, and another man who was found in a ditch. Both of them were, or all three of them, were essentially found in the same way. But Mr. Nice was found dead on the hot, um, side of Highway 23, across from the airport, or now C.D. Smith, right about where that Taco Bell is. So anytime you stroll on in there, you grab some you know, late night cravings. Remember, that's where his body was. <laughs> um, the specifics of his murder was he was shot twice in the back of the head, the same as the other two gentlemen. He, his body was tossed from a car. There was a bottle of moonshine found under him. And um, all of his jewelry, all of his cash, everything, um, was not taken. So they didn't think that this was just a random mugging or robbery. This was meant with a very specific message. And they found in his coat pocket a map with little markings on it that they, the police knew corresponded to known still operations. So um, he, he played this very dangerous game and paid with his life. It was relatively common at that time. They called it taking a ride. Um, there, this was something that gained national attention. The newspapers out of Milwaukee had this going on. There were federal um, investigators that came in to help with the investigation. And basically what they, the case went cold on March 1st, 1932. And it's unclear if it was ever solved. Um, but it was essentially part of a widespread Chicago mafia um, execution of individuals who were doing the same thing as him, posing as federal agents. These are a pair of local, um, just local stills that were found. Um, so this one's from John Ott up in Jericho. And this is very common. I have had quite a few people um, bring these uh, or show me photographs of these. And they'll say, oh yeah, I found this out in our barn. I found this in our shed. This was very, very typical uh, of a simple <coughs> conversion. This one here is a little more ornate. This was in my Uncle Dale's barn. And so when I started this project, I was over there for Thanksgiving or something, and I was talking about this research, and he said, well, JJ, I have a still out in my barn. And if you know my Uncle Dale, you'd be like, yeah, I don't doubt it, Dale. I bet you <laughs> So uh, he's like, no, 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 JJ, like a historical one. And I'm like, what do you mean? So we go out in his barn, and sure enough, here's this very cool still sitting. And it's just, just that way. That's exactly, um, I took a picture before we moved it or did anything with it. And he's like, oh yeah, I always wondered what that was. I mean, we had it all decorated up and it was part of my uh, Halloween party, you know, it was a good time. Um, so you might have, you probably have seen these. Um, the black, blackness along the bottom suggests that they were used actually. Now, if you do have one of these at home, please don't use it because that is all lead solder. <laughs> 
And uh, one of the long-term complications of drinking moonshine is lead poisoning, which is not fun, so don't do that. Um, there are many, many reputable still uh, proprietors on the internet uh, that you can get with lead-free solder on them if you are really that hardcore and want to go do it. Uh, but if you have one of these guys, um, just leave it alone. Basically the conclusion of my research and my presentation today is that um, without, without moonshining and bootlegging in the Holy Land, many of the communities, many of the farmers in that area likely would not have been able to survive not only the agrarian depression but also the Great Depression. And so illegal uh, alcohol operations allowed for cash to flow into communities to keep them alive until the repeal of national prohibition and with the, um, uh, with the, the economy getting better in the late 30s. So finally, prohibition is something everybody wants to know about, but not a lot of people want to talk about. So if you have stories, um, please write them down, share them with people, do a recording of it, um, because we're, we're all only here for a certain amount of time. All of our experience is very unique. And so if we can capture that to share with future generations, I really, really, really hope you do that. So, um, are there any questions that anybody yeah, has? Yes, sir. I want to know if anyone ever heard of Eggersville. No, South of St. Peter on the corner. Yeah. Okay. And that was a cheese factory. My father-in-law is a uh, brother born there. Okay. And no one seems to uh, know where it is at. The building is still there. It's a concrete building. Okay. Eggersville? Eggersville, yeah. The last name was Eggers. Okay. I remember one time my father told me to go to hell because he got a gallon of moon he was delivering. <laughs> <laughs> Worth a lot. They get to give out so much money for all these different for bribes and that. What kind of money did they make? I don't. He talks about it in the interview and I can't remember off the top of my head, but I mean it was thousands of dollars. It was ridiculous the amount that they would make. Um, bribes were, you know, usually in the hundreds, so. Were, were people that sold moonshine, were they frowned upon by the community? Um, not, not so much. When you, when you listen to, um, when you, when you read or you listen to the interviews, um, it wasn't seen as a negative sort of, um, presence. It was seen as positive or indifference as in, well, they don't bother us, we don't bother them sort of thing. But they saw the, the um, benefits to having them around. They, and when they did cause trouble, in general, they made things right. Um, from the, when you, like the newspaper accounts that I've heard about, um, there, you know, there wasn't lots of trouble as in um, crime or murders and that sort of thing. Something I thought of when you mentioned making the mash in the cheese factory. How long did it take to get the make get the mash to where it was ready to distill? That's a great question. I mean, in his interview, he makes it sound like it was overnight, but in general, it takes um, a couple of days. So it was usually that there'd be different stages of you would you wouldn't have every all your eggs in one basket, if you will. You might have let's say six cisterns. And then every third day, you're using one of those cisterns or two of those cisterns to run your operation. What made you think of that is everything you see, like you know, big stories coming mm -hmm. from Kentucky and Tennessee, and, and you never, no one ever goes through the mash process. All sure. of a sudden, they've got the mash and they're distilling it. Yeah, and, that, and, <laughs> and it depends on temperatures, um, and that can take up to two weeks depending on types of yeast. Um, so oftentimes, they'll have kind of a staggered setup. Especially something like this, where it's kind of continuous operation, they would have multiple cisterns or multiple matches going, so that there's kind of this constant overturn. So I suppose even seeing in Kentucky, they're making the match someplace and then taking it to the to the still. Uh, every operation would be different, um, but in here these would usually be very, pretty close, um, simply because transporting that is you know it's a challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did the church play any role in this? Is it positive or negative?
Um, not that I found any like solid as a uh, Harvard anything. Um, I did not see any sort of organized um, anti-alcohol um, events or that sort of thing where like the anti saloon League or the Women's Christian Temperance Union came to Northeastern Wisconsin and had any sort of function. But that's a great question. What about being a beneficiary of all this cash flow? I, I you know, finding that hard evidence doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, I will, there, there's some prominent names in Northeastern Wisconsin that were very likely involved and dirty money got clean after prohibition through various entities. Um, but again, finding beyond people telling me that is really difficult. Right, right. But as far as um, did the church get monetary, um, I'm sure to a degree, but. Some of those churches in that area are absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and those are often built. Uh, <laughs> those are often built, you know, prior to prohibition. I'm trying to think like St. John's is 1900 or so, so. But the beautification thereafter, probably. Have you published a book? I am not. Um, Will you? <laughs> someday. But what I am happy to do is if you guys, uh, if people write down their name, emails, up here I will send you a PDF of my paper. And it won't have everything I talked about today, but it will, it's the original paper. So there's usually, you know, it's not everything because obviously I've been developing this. But if you write down your name and email, I will send you an email with the PDF article for you to read. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. I never actually found out. Just kind of rolled it, but. You mentioned doing any research on New London, because I know they have a very heavy Irish. Uh, is that they some more Irish versus the Germans that are over here? Did you do any research? I, I know New London is very heavily Irish. But as far as the bootlegging, is that more of an Irish type of family over there? Or? I, um, what was the last thing? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, the gentleman who wrote the, the book on that area um, didn't really comment too much on the Irish Catholic sort of ethnicity sort of thing. Um, that's something I should follow up with. I, this is a little bit off the subject, but on the corner of Main Street and where, I don't know, where the old Division. Schmidt Schmidt oh, the, the where the sign about Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation. Yep. Can, you, can you enlighten me on that? Yeah. It was it was much um, much less than people think. So if you read the actual newspapers about the Carry Nation incident in Fond du Lac, uh, it was essentially she was there. I think she smashed like one bottle, but the patrons that were in the bar were so upset about it that they trashed the place. <laughs> so she really didn't cause a tremendous amount of the drama. It was more so the people that were there at the time. Um, so when you read about it, it's really not thought of as a major incident, um, but it got hyped up on a national scale because that was what the Women's Christian Temperance Union would do is they would go in, Cary Nation especially, would go into a community and they would make these very big public displays and speeches and it would be very rousing to people. Um, and then they would, they would try to get the headlines with this and, and then they used this incident in Fond du Lac as a look at all the evils of alcohol, look what these people did. And then the people in Fond du Lac said, no, 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 she did this. So it's, it, it wasn't really that big of a thing, but it got very high up. They were trashed if they were consuming? I don't, they kind of, they, I don't remember exactly what happened in the bar room, but it wasn't so much that she caused the issue, it was the people that were there. So I, I have the newspaper article somewhere. You mentioned Cap Well, I had until about 1950, he had a tavern on the corner of Main and Reed Street, Todd Lake. Northeast corner. It's pretty close, well, it's pretty close to St. Patrick's Church. That's not, well, we're going to go to the Holy Land. Well, that's why I left earlier the church. <laughs> you mentioned the uh, high alcohol time plan. As I think I heard, like 180 crew. Uh, this isn't drinkable. Are they cutting it back after they ship it? Did they, they cut it back? Yes, they would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they would dilute it and cut it down. To after it was shipped. Yeah. They would ship, ship it. And, they would ship it. And, they would ship it. And, they would ship it and, 
we uh, you, just, you can just start in the bottom. Or put it out in the bottom. But they would ship it at this high alcohol content? Yes. Yeah, because they, I mean, they, would have, they wanted it as concentrated as possible. And then it would get redistributed into bottles and what else? And then the yeah, there cans. Is that kind of purity of it still. Right. And it is amazing. But usually it would require two distillations, or they would have it set up so that by the end of the line, things had been um, concentrated in that well, thank you all for coming. Um, if you have more questions, something to share, come on up. Otherwise, please sign up if you want a copy of the PDF. Have a good day.